All right, so we're going to talk about math running records and kind of where they come from and so forth. Um, it, I wrote a book on them in 2016, I think. And I wrote the book because I was a literacy person and I wanted to um, really figure out a system where we could figure out what was going on with kids in math because we know where kids are in literacy. We give them a running mm -hmm. record. And so I wanted to create the same thing in math. So I looked at the research and I came up with a math running record. Now running records had been done for years, decades in the research, but the way they did it was a, a person would sit down with a PowerPoint and they would go three seconds at a time and they would ask kids questions about um, problems. And so we have all this data on what kids do when they see different problems, how they act, you know, and interact with the problems. And mm -hmm. so, um, so what I did was I gathered all that research and I made something that we could actually use in classrooms because we don't have time to sit down with individual children and show them 90 slides and ask them questions about things. Right. So um, a running record is a system to collect consistent data across grades, grade bands, and schools um, on students' basic fact fluency power. Basic facts are defined as addition and subtraction, zero to 20. That's basic facts. Now, there are all kinds of other facts, but these are basic facts. And then there's multiplication and division, and that's zero to 100. And those are basic facts. So like 12 times five is not a basic fact. 10 times five is, right? So anything that has a product within 100 is a basic fact. Um, hold on for one second. Okay. Um, just... Okay, so, so that's important about basic facts because people will go beyond basic facts and they'll be like, oh, they don't know these, but those aren't basic facts. Those are extended facts. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so why do we need them? Because oftentimes I'll ask teachers, well, you know, what do they know? And they'll be like, oh, well, I think they kind of know their, you know, they know how to add with intent, but there's no evidence. It's just kind of like right. hunches that people are going on and gut feelings. And yeah, I mean, you need evidence, right? So I borrow from Clay who said, becoming observers and watch children at work in systematic and repeatable ways. It, it has to be systematic. We have to have a way of collecting data that is systematic mm -hmm. and repeatable and reliable. So when we look at math running records, they're taken to uncover specific strategy levels, right? And we know what those levels are, like there's level zero where kids have no strategy. There's level one where they're doing a lot of counting. There's level two where they are doing it in their head. There's level three where there's, they've really started looking at numbers and depending on strategies. So they'll use what they know to help with what they don't know. So like kids that say, I don't know five times seven, but I know five times five is 25. And then I'm going to add five more and five more. Those kids are using what's called derived facts. And so they're at a level three. Or kids okay. that are like, I don't know eight plus seven, but I know eight plus eight is 16. So one less is going to be 15. Or I know seven plus seven is 14. So one more is going to be 15. Those kids are using a level three. It's called derived facts. Okay. And then um, on the running record, there's two other levels. There's 4M, which are, are kids that have memorized. And so those are kids that are like, I don't know that one, right? Th th they've memorized their numbers, but they don't know all of them. So if they've only memorized them, then they're tethered to their memory. And when it gives out, then they're stuck. Or there's kids that are like a level four, not a four M, but a four, and they know they're not, they have profound number sense, and they know a lot of their facts automatically. And if they ever get stuck, they can go back to derived strategies. Okay. Those are like levels that you're looking for when you're giving the running record. You're trying to see what, what are they doing? Like, do they just say, I don't know that one? Like, they have no strategy. They can't, like, you say, hey, what if I gave you some paper? They're like, I don't know it. Pass. 
But kids that are like, oh, if I had some paper, I could figure it out. And they like draw pictures and stuff. Those kids are like a level one at least, even if they're just counting, they at right. least have a strategy, which is different from a kid that's like, I don't know it at all. Yeah. Those are most of the kids, at least the upper grades that I'm working with. That's what I'm finding with them. Okay. I don't know. Everything is, I don't know. Everything is, I don't know. Right. And so we're trying yeah. to move them. We're trying to move them to have strategies. Right. Right. So to have an evidence, why, why do we do running records? So that we have an evidence-based system of data collection that can inform our instruction. So like what's really important about that is like, say you have kids where you're working on subtraction and you say, what's eight minus three? And the first child says like 83. Then you're like, okay, whoa, whoa hold on. <laughs> you know, <laughs> there's an intervention that needs to take place and it has nothing to do with subtraction at this point. Right. So we have to go back and like build actual understanding of subtraction. We're not even working on procedure right now, right? But then you have another child that says eight minus three is 11. So that's a specific error pattern. And you'll see that on the running record. So you're like, oh, they're adding instead of subtracting. They're using the wrong operation. So right. that's very different than the child that says 83, right? Yeah. Or say you have another child and they say, you say, what's eight minus three? And they go eight, seven, six. So that is a miscount, right? And that's a procedural error. They're counting the eight. So you want to fix that, right? But that's different than the child that's adding or the child that's just putting those two numbers together and saying 83. So um, you want to look at what is the thinking behind the thinking? What is the error pattern? So that intervention actually addresses whatever the error pattern is. That's really important about running records. Okay. So you're, always, you're always thinking about what did they do? Not did they just get it right or wrong, but what did they do, right? And then you take records to plan whole group, small group, workstations, individual work, homework, you know, all of that. And so when should you do them? You do them at the beginning of the year, the middle of the year, and the end of the year. And then you, if you're like doing an intervention with an eighth grader who knows like not even addition, then you're going to do them more often because, yeah, I mean, you really have to lay some basic fact power and you're trying to do a lot. So you're going to, you know, do more than you would with like a first grader. You know what I mean? Right. Um, so it really depends on the students. You should do them. You can just pull kids aside. You do them wherever you would do like a regular reading, running record. You do them <laughs> at the end of first grade. So I have a kindergarten test, which is a counting test, but you don't really start doing running records until the end of kinder. And then you do them first and fifth, and then people do them in middle school for kids. Yeah. That Okay. So, so now I do have some middle school kids, but I definitely want to see where they're at, at because I mean, we were just doing um, multiplication bingo, which uh -huh. they're, and I'm, I'm talking single digit multiplication problems that they should have known in third grade and they don't know them. Right. Right. So that's, we got it. We got to close those gaps. I mean, right. That's, that's, this is exactly what the running record is going to tell you is like where to start. Cause a lot of times people will just get kids flashcards and say practice. I mean, that's yeah. not helpful. Right. So you want to find out like, do they know their twos? Like the little boy that I tested this morning, he doesn't even know his twos. He knows, oh, it's a double, but he's counting like eight okay. plus eight. He had to count eight and then count on. So that's, a, so he, we can't say he knows his twos. So we've got to go back with him and work on his doubles so that he can know his twos. And then we would teach fours and then we would teach eights, right? Okay. So like the order of how you teach kids to think strategically, which we'll talk a lot about more in a little while. So when we define fluency, it's not like who can get the answer fast automaticity, which means you can answer a problem within three seconds, is a result. It's an outcome of being fluent. It's not like the goal. Fluency is the goal. And fluency means that you are efficient, 
flexible and accurate. Flexible meaning you know lots of ways. Efficient meaning you know easy ways, right? Easy, quick ways. So there, you could know lots of ways, but what is going to be the most efficient way? Right. So um, and then kids need to be able to select the strategy that's appropriate for the math that they're doing. Um, and they need to be able to explain what they're doing. So you'll notice on the running record in part two, we ask kids to explain what they're doing. OK, um, we want them to base their strategies in base 10 properties and the relationships between the numbers. So it's not just quick answers that we're looking for. We want kids that have number sense, and that's what we're trying to build. So computational fluency is multidimensional, right? And I want you to think about those four pillars, that it's flexible, accurate, efficient, and being able to select the correct strategy. So now we get to like, how does the running record help us build fluency? So what the running record does is it tests all those things. Are they accurate? Mm -hmm instant at the, the first part takes like a minute. Are they accurate and instant? The second part you're looking for, are they flexible and efficient, right? And that takes like eight, eight minutes, five to eight minutes. And then the third part is like 30 seconds, but you're trying to find out how they feel about math. Do they like division or math multiplication or whatever you're doing? Um, and what do they do when they get stuck? Because we need kids to have strategies for when mm -hmm. they get stuck. Um, and so when you're interviewing kids, there's a couple of things. You have to really know like um, what they're doing and watch it and record it. Because in an interview, kids will do things that they don't tell you. And they will tell you things that they didn't do. So they might, right, right. They might be like, how did you know that? And they're like, oh, I just knew it. And they sat there and counted on their fingers. Or you might say, how did you know it? And they said, oh, I skip counted. But they knew it automatically. So you have to really watch what they're actually doing right to record that like there's a little girl and I was like what are you doing she goes oh I'm skip counting but I knew she was taking a really long time I was mm -hmm. like oh, I don't that, it doesn't seem like she's skip counting and um so finally I kept saying I need to know I need you to sh to tell me out loud what you're doing and so finally she was going one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve so she's counting by ones but she's calling it skip counting right Excuse me. right and I'm like oh okay so you really you know you have to probe and sometimes it takes kids a really long time to let you know what they're doing but it's worth investing the time to find out because that's where you're really going to be able to help them okay um, so when you're assessing for um automaticity you're trying to see like do they know it automatically or are they thinking flexibly so we ask kids questions like if your friend was stuck what would you tell them to see if they actually have strategies. Um, and we also want to know about their disposition. Students' facility in using basic math facts often has a significant effect on their confidence in themselves as mathematicians. So, okay. so, you know, I always ask people to think about what are you doing right now in terms of math fact tests? And have you ever thought about assessing for disposition? Right. So that's really important. So that is the um, general overview.